Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome back once again as we take a look at more offerings from React Knife. And I just want to get some clarification out of the way right here from the very beginning. If you go back and you watch my oldest videos on React, going back, I guess, about four years now, uh, back to the, uh, the old days of the Horizon and, and things like that, I had spoken with David Dang, the owner of React, and, and the way that I had pronounced it, which is React, was the proper way. And what's funny is over the course of the years, listening to so many other people saying the damn name, even I have fallen into the laziness of just going, ah, whatever comes out of my mouth is going to work, like Riati and Riate and all these other different ways of, of saying it. But it is actually truly Riat. I talked to David again uh, about a week or so ago and went, hey, listen, was I right back then? Because I kind of corrected myself thinking everybody else was right and I just got lazy with it. He's like, no, you were right. It's Riat. Riat. That's, that's, that's how you pronounce it. So from here on out, Riat Knives. Now, what we're looking at is the K-series. The K-1s, the K-2s, which are not pictured here just yet, the K-3 and the K-4. What I have here obviously is going to be the more premium variations, but as I go through each model, I'll let you know that there are different variations and, and they start as little as $400. That doesn't sound like a little if you're only buying standard production knives, but for the level of knife making that we're seeing here, yes, $400 is very, very, very little. What Riyadh has done is they have forever changed, I believe, the, the, uh, the way the, the knife industry is going to work. If you're a custom knife maker and you decide, hey, I want to make a production version of one of my knives, or I want to make a mid-tech version of one of my knives, uh, you are now forced to make a knife and sell it for under $400 or over $800 because that $500 to $800 price range for a mid-tech or a custom knife is now forever endangered because people look at these and go, hmm, I'm getting a lot more for my money here. I'm getting premium materials like CTS-204P or M390 or Dama Steel or RWL-34. All these great steels, I'm getting uh, titanium, of course, I'm getting Mokutai, I'm getting all these amazing things with ceramic bearings and uh, travel over stops and steel lock bar inserts. All of the things I would expect from a custom knife and the actions are better than so many custom knife makers are even capable of. And I'm able to get stuff like uh, true hand rub satin blades now these days. Uh, they have really upped their game so much that they're putting everybody else on their toes. They really have changed what we've come to expect in knife making. And it's, it's tough. It's making it really difficult for a lot of people. But you know what? Maybe that was the push that we all needed. Am I going to spend uh, $600 on a high-end Benchmade uh, like their Gold Class? And they actually go higher than that. Or am I going to spend $400 on a React knife that has the same materials, better build quality, better consistency, better action? Uh, yeah, it makes it really, really, really tough. And forget about trying to make a mid-tech these days. So that's where I feel React stands in the knife industry. But let's go through the knives very quickly and show you some of the differences. Uh, so we're starting here. This is the K1. The K1 is going to have this uh, inlay done on both sides in the same spot. And it's more or less a drop point. That's kind of what they're calling it. And I'm fine with that. But it's to me, it's a little bit more stylized than that. Then we get to the K2. Now, the K2 I have off to the side over here because I'm going to be doing a separate video on the K2s. Now, here's just a great example of their value. The K2 in my hand right here is 325 bucks. 325 bucks. You cannot make a mid-tech knife for that, uh, or I should say cannot sell a mid-tech mid knife for that. And uh, you're in the realm of high-end productions, of which this pretty much kicks all of their butts. So you've got that. You know, then they also have some customized variations of that as well. So look for that video here soon in the future. Next, we go to the K3. There are two different blade profiles for the K3. You can get the drop point or you can get the Tanto. 
uh, and it's completely up to you which way you want to go. Um, one is obviously much more stylized than the other. Then you've got the K4. K4 is a little bit chunkier, a little bit heavier. Um, actually, no, it's not even heavier. It's, it's, it's heavier than the K1, but it's about the same weight uh, as the K3. Wildly different kind of grinds on there, and you'll notice that they're offering a lot of hollow grinds now, which is a really, 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 really big deal in the way that they're manufacturing. So that's basically, so K1, K3s, and the K4. I'm going to encompass all of these in one video. So let's get some of these out of the way and focus on them one at a time. And we'll start here with the K1. Now, it is virtually impossible for me to pick an absolute favorite out of all of these. But I would have to say, if I were looking for the one that most closely resembled a full custom knife, I would say it's the K1. And it's for a number of reasons. Number one you're getting the crown spine on the blade. Now while that obviously is a nice aesthetic feature, it also adds strength to the blade. Number two, you've got a full hand rub satin blade. The other ones have hand rub satin flats, which is this area here, and then the bevels are done in a high, high belt satin, so it's done on the machine. Beautiful grind on here very clean, very sweet, I think. And uh, I love I love what they've done here with the extra bevel. Looks very, very cool. Then you have the unique way that they've machined this frame that gives you a wildly different look. What that is, is they've taken this titanium slab, okay, they've obviously milled out this pocket where they're going to be laying the inlay. However, they're then taking this whole area here, and they're stepping it down just a tiny bit and leaving a raised lip that serves as a framework around the inlay so that that is polished and this is the the matte bead blasted finish down here so they can bead blast the whole thing go back just over the, the high, high parts and bring a polish out which serves as a frame for the Mokutai inlay how brilliant is that really really cool You've got a really nicely made backspacer. The whole frame tapers toward the rear. It's got a really nice look to it. You'll notice the signature Todd Bag ceramic ball in the pocket clip, which David uses with, uh, with Todd's permission. And of course the action is just uh, out of this world. They're fast, they're extremely smooth, and whether the knife is open or closed, it just looks sexy. So, some basic specifications on the K1. Uh, 3.875 inches for your blade length. Look at that beautiful sweeping belly on there. It is Bowler M390 steel. They are all hollow ground and you've got ceramic bearings to allow for that very fast and very smooth action. The weight is just under five ounces, which when you think about it, for a knife this size, okay, uh, with an overall length of eight and three quarter inches, that's really, really, really lightweight. Think about this, I could pick up my bodega and it weighs almost seven ounces. So this is a very, very lightweight knife. They have milled out pockets within the titanium frame that allow them to further reduce the weight. It's got a nice full-size knife feel because of the shape of the blade, but without the extreme weight of, of a knife that really would be that big. So we talked about the hollow grind, we talked about the crown spine, uh, let's see, oh, one other thing, and this will apply to all of the knives out here. They're using a special process that David has named Freeze Edging Skill. So, for those of you that have never ground a blade, don't know a lot about knives, what happens is when you're grinding your bevels, you get to a certain point, then you heat treat because you can't have it too thin because when you go to heat treat, you can warp the steel. So, once you're done with the heat treat, you can either have, you know, 30% left to grind or if you're the type that likes to what we call hard grind, 
you've already heat treated the blade before doing anything and then you grind the whole thing after heat treat but regardless there is going to be some some degree of grindage after heat treat which means you have hardened the steel and then you have tempered the steel so that it's not going to shatter by breathing on it it's not that hard so there's a science to getting the right degree of hardness where it's going to retain an edge but not be too brittle well what happens is while you're grinding if the steel gets too hot you can ruin that temper and that will soften the edge what that means to you as the user is the edge isn't going to last very long I've actually seen some knives, we'll go back to the uh, the days uh, four or five years ago when Zero Tolerance had their issue with LMAX. LMAX is a phenomenal steel, but it got a bad rap at first because they were burning through their temper as they were grinding the blades. So what you got, in essence, was a knife that wasn't hard. So you would cut a couple pieces of cardboard and then it was a completely dull knife with this freeze edging skill again that's the proprietary name that David gives to this what they're doing is they are super cooling the steel while they're grinding it so it never allows the the blade to get hot enough to ruin the temper now, I don't know the exact process I believe it is something that's a bit more complicated than just grinding with a cool mist uh, attachment spraying water on it while it's being ground uh, I, for him to call it freeze edging tells me that it's something that's uh, quite a bit more extreme than just spraying water on it and that will apply to every knife they make so this again is the uh, the K1 I feel it is the most custom in the way that it has been presented with all of the little touches and by the way everything is nicely dehorned rounded off not a single hot spot on that entire knife I can't say it's my favorite because I also really 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 like the K3 but if I, if I were to look at this and go I only I only I would only be able to keep one of these knives it would be the K1 so it does have that slight edge for me it looks more custom it feels more custom and it has more custom touches just like if you were to buy this from a custom knife maker for fifteen sixteen eighteen hundred dollars and that's a good point let's talk about the prices if you look at the base model which would be marbled carbon fiber uh, you'd be looking at four hundred dollars if you wanted this version with the M390 satin blade and the Mokutai inlay, it's $750. And if you wanted to have a Dama steel blade with the Mokutai inlay, it's $950. So think about this. Look at this knife here, the way that it sits. I'm going to tell you right now, this would be $1,300, $1,400, $1,500 from any fairly decent custom knife maker. Midtech doesn't exist. Nobody makes a knife like this in a mid-tech unless you're buying a mid-tech that then the custom maker will then modify for you by doing something like adding the Mokutai. Looking at the size of this Mokutai and the fact that it's on both sides, you got a couple hundred bucks worth of raw materials just in the inlays. So is it worth it? Yeah, to me it is. If you love Mokutai, this is absolutely going to be worth it. I think they're all worth it. I think they're all easily worth it. You know, when you break it down to the base price of $400 and then your your incremental price increases really only come with much more expensive materials. You know, let's go ahead and get into uh, another one here and we'll talk about that as well because, you know, when you get into the K3s and K4s, you have even more options. Like with the K4, you can get a Dama steel blade and Dama steel inlays, or you can have a regular M390 blade with Dama steel inlays. So there's so many different combinations, it's almost mind boggling. But let's go ahead and get the K3 out here, and we'll do a quick size comparison so you can see that really they're all about the same size. So again, just to uh, re reference this, the, uh, the K1 overall length was 8 and 3 quarter with a 3.875 inch blade same exact thing uh, same, excuse me same exact thing for the K3 and the only real difference is going to be in the 
uh, K4. It's just a tiny little bit smaller. So here you have these side by side. I'll go ahead and line this one back up too, just so you can see them uh, in one shot together. So the uh, K4 is only slightly smaller, and the majority of the size difference really is in the uh, in the blade length. So we'll get that out of there. We'll get rid of the K1 and focus now on the K3. Now when you look at the K3, the base model again is $400 and that would be with CTS-204P and carbon fiber inlays. When you jump up to this version, which has, just want to verify, yep, still has CTS-204P and stepping up into the Mokutai inlays, that brings you to about $650. Now these are these are basic prices I'm talking about. Different retailers may charge a few dollars more or a few dollars less. And then if you want to really step up, it would be the Mokutai inlays with Dama steel blades, and then you're looking at about $850. And it really is fair to look at Pretty much any knife, whether it be a production knife, which there aren't that many production knives. I'm trying to think, maybe a handful of production knives that have ever been made with damaged steel blades. But mid-tech and custom knives, figure you're going to add $300 to go from whatever steel is in there uh, to the damaged steel option. Number one, damaged steel is very, very expensive. Number two, it takes a lot more work to, to work with damaged steel because that blade has to be, and every part of it has to be mirror polished. And then beyond that, you have your uh, multiple steps of etching in order to get the look that you really want to get out of Dama Steel. So you're always going to pay a premium. Let's talk about this version first, the Tanto version. Um, I will say that of the two, this is my favorite. I love, and it really is, it's, it's almost like a modified Warncliffe with a reverse tanto and that's really the way that I look at it. So if you had a worn cliff you'd have that straight edge they modified that by kicking it up and when you look at this it's it's not really a tanto it's actually a reverse tanto because that sharp angle that would be here you know going this way is just flipped so it's going this way. But it's okay I suppose to call it a tanto because you know it, it is running this way and then being upswept a little bit so there's no def real true definitive term for this blade shape. The only thing that bothers me, and again, I say I really, really, really love this knife, but the only thing that bothers me is it is very derivative of what Gus Sacchini did, GTC Knives, with the Airborne. And you guys, if you go back in my uh, library of videos, you'll see the Airborne that uh, he made for me a few years ago. And that really was the first time I had seen this particular uh, stylization of the blade. Now again, it is certainly very different. It's ground very different. You've got the top swedge adding a little bit more of a pronounced uh, difference. Uh, this really does recess down to where this almost forms a harpoon. There are absolutely distinct differences. However, when you really just look at the the shape of it, if it were just drawn on a piece of paper and you couldn't see detail, you would think that was a GTC blade. That's the only part that bothers me. And, and that only bothers me because Riet has been so good about creating unique designs. Because one of the things that people really give hell to Chinese manufacturing is the fact that they knock off other established products, make their own version, and make it cheaper. And I've always been so proud of uh, Riet because they don't do that. Everything has been an original design. And while this still is an original design, as I said, it is derivative. So that's the only real minus I can give uh, across the board on any of these knives. So uh, once again, uh, you're looking at that same full size, eight and three quarter inches. This one gives you the multi row bearings. Uh, I, I can't believe that they're <laughs> putting so much into these knives for the money because the base model again is 400 bucks so you know let's let's imagine for a moment we don't have the beautiful mokutai let's just say we had the carbon fiber in there you'd be buying titanium carbon fiber inlays cts 204 p steel with multi-row bearings ceramic detent over travel stop uh steel on steel lockup the the custom uh milled and sculpted titanium pocket clip this incredible 
backspacer that has been, uh, you've got the frame skeletonized to expose portions of it. All of that incredible work, you would have been able to buy for 400 bucks. And again, that really is a screaming ridiculous deal. When we look at these knives close up, and, and I should go back because I really didn't give you much of a close up here on the K1. Let me just give you a quick sweep so that you can see the degree of quality and the fit and finish that's applied to every one of these knives and then we'll go right back to the uh, to the K3 there is no imperfection to be found either in the design or in the execution even the little touches like the fact that they have radius right here for the lock so you don't have anything sharp engaging your thumb as you're constantly flipping and unlocking your knife. The grinds are spot on perfect. Their hand rub satin is spot on perfect. The inlay work is nicely done. Their pocket clips again always complement their overall designs and I love the shape of this backspacer. It's wonderfully integrated into this design. Now we get to the K3. Now here you may not be getting the full hand rub satin blade but you are getting the hand rub satin flats and ricasso and then each of the bevels so you have three grinds on each side so all six grinds are a very high satin belt finish everything is hollow ground extraordinarily sharp every single knife I've ever picked up from Riyadh has been extraordinarily sharp I prefer less to call these inlays and more to say that there are windows cut into the titanium exposing the panels of Mokutai but you'll notice they're not put in from the from the back here so they really are inlaid into the material but they do leave a little bit of a lip all the way around so it, it, it feels more like this is a uh, a window that's exposing material underneath Another thing, and I don't know if the camera is really going to catch it, but I want you to take a look. If you look at the overall finish on the titanium, it's done in a matte, bead-blasted finish, which is very, very, very smooth. There's no roughness to it. Same thing for the backspacer. But on the very edge of the exposed portion of the backspacer, it's done in a high-finish satin. So as you move this and the light bounces off of it, you catch that extra little bit of work and design that they put into it. I think it's just gorgeous. Uh, I do remember when I posted the images of all these knives up on Instagram when I first got them, a lot of people said that they really wish that there was some Mokutai on this side of the knife and they said they really missed an opportunity by not putting a Mokutai inlay right there in the clip. And you know what? I I'm not going to disagree. I like the fact that they're not just creating a boring lock side. There's a lot of machining that's been done here. I'd love to see more people that are making frame locks put that effort into their lock sides because a lot of times you'll have these beautiful presentation sides and you flip over the knife and it's just plain. There's nothing there. And a lot of people have stopped buying frame locks because they feel that they're not getting their money's worth out of it and I totally understand that. So at least the machining is done and I dig that. But yeah, it would have been nice to see a pop of Mokutai on this side, whether it be a little inlay here or an inlay in both of those pockets uh, probably would have been nice. But then again, you know, it would have raised the cost a little bit more, maybe another $50, $7,500. Because again, Mokutai is so expensive. As we've come to expect from Riet, everything is just super smooth, super fast. Their flipper tabs are done extraordinarily well, great angles and great jimping on there so your fingers do not slide off. The grinds are exceptionally well done. Mokutai is beautiful. All the way around a beautifully, beautifully executed knife. Now let's take a look at the drop point version. So it is exactly the same knife from here back. There are no differences. 
the difference is going to be in the blade profile. So you've got a bit of a, a belly in here. It does come down to that drop point. They've accentuated again. They've made these things look a little bit more aggressive uh, by putting that top clip or that top swedge on there. Really, really, really nicely done. Very clean grinds on these. And again, as I mentioned, everything is the same as far as the handle goes. See the milled out pockets to reduce weight. Take a look at the lock up here. And that's pretty much it for the K3. And last but not least, we get to the K4. Now, when we look at the K4, this is a little bit more of a, what I think is a little bit more of a standard looking Riat knife. Because you've got that high tech look going on in the frame and it's done in a stone wash finish. Out of all these, it is the only one that has been done in that stone washed finish. And I think some people are going to appreciate that, especially when you look at all the milling that's been done and that's all polished inside of there so you've got a neat two-tone effect that even if you didn't have the mokuta you'd have something that really pops it's also the only version that gives you the blue titanium hardware everything else is going to be the silver titanium hardware this is also going to be the only version that gives you a full mokuta backspacer and it really is gorgeous and that Mokutai backspacer also integrates the lanyard opening where they've cut away the frame, made the opening through the backspacer, and you can attach your lanyard to the rear. And it's the only version that gives you the Mokutai pocket clip. So, ta-da! On this side, you've got that splash of color. And it's also the only version that gives you that full recurve. And I love this grind. Definitely a little bit reminiscent of Mixed Rider's Nightmare Grind, except Mixed Grind is much, much shorter on the primary. But look how sexy that is. Beautifully, beautifully done. All right, so the specs on this, uh, eight and a half inches, actually 8.56 inches in overall length with a 3.72 inch blade. See, that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's a very, very tiny difference. Uh, between the sizes on these and uh, you've also got M390 on this as well notice again this is where I, I made that delineation uh, let's go ahead and bring it back out with the K1 you know the K1 has that beautiful very very smooth crown spine whereas this one does not now, it doesn't really need to because you've got that massive top swedge running, oh geez, you know, 80% of the, of the spine of the blade. But again, that, that is that custom touch difference that I feel just kind of sets the K1 apart from the others. I don't think it takes away from the others. I think it just allows it to be elevated a little bit above the others. Now, this one is actually more expensive in its base version. If you buy the K4, you're going to be paying $420 for M390 in carbon fiber inlays. And I think the only the, the difference in price is probably going to be in the colorization of the hardware. If you spend $550, you'll get M390 with Dama Steel inlays. How cool is that? And for $800, you get a Dama Steel blade and Dama Steel inlays, which I think would look really, really cool. Again, because you've got this uh, stonewashed titanium frame, and then you're going to have the polished Dama Steel set into it. I think it would look really, really cool. So here is your close-up look on the K4. And I think each of these distinctly different models give you something different to love about them. Um, while I mentioned that the K4 out of all of them, you know, because if you had to really choose when you're looking at all of them, this would be my least favorite. Um, there's still so many things I love. I love this grind. I'm a sucker for a recurve blade. They're sexy. They're great for slicing. 
if you're looking at a knife that uh, you want to have as a secondary, a backup, as self-defense, having a recurve is a really, really good idea. It's going to dig further into the meat, and as you're pulling through, it's going to drag itself further into it in case you're in, uh, in a fight with a, with a T-bone. I really like how the inlays were done. It's almost imperceptible. I love the milling that they've done. I love the contrast in the finishes, even without having the Mokutai. I like having the inset of these ceramic bearings into the frame. And you may not have noticed those at first, but how cool is that? And you really, I don't feel them as I'm holding the knife. I don't feel them at all. So they're certainly not uh, going to be obtrusive in any way. I like the fact that you get that premium material in the Mokutai in the back spacer and the pocket clip. And I tell you right now, that is one hell of an expensive back spacer right there. That would be a good solid $200 option from any custom maker as you were building your knife. So there is the basic breakdown and comparison between all of these different models. Let's see if I can get them all back on the table again. And I honestly think that no matter which way you go, you can't lose. You've got a real solid built knife. The feel of a true custom, no matter which way you go. I would tell you that if you want the most original and the one that would be, in my opinion, the most collectible as it feels the most custom, it's the K1. I love the blade shape. I love the grinds. I love the full hand rub satin blade. I love the fact that you've got the contrasting frame. Well, it's not really a frame because I don't want you to think that's a separate piece, uh, but the framework around the inlay that's, that's built up from the, uh, from the actual frame of the knife beautiful work that really took a lot of time to do I think these are more futuristic and maybe a bit more aggressive and this might be more of your I don't even want to call it a more everyday look because we're looking at you know fancy models of Mokutai but you know if we stripped all that away I think this is probably the more EDC looking of the uh, three variations that we see here and when you really take a look at where Riyadh has come from back in the horizon days where everything was just simple stone washed and slab sided a little bit of milling here and there a little bit of customization to where they are now it's insane and that's a progression of only about three years so I'm really interested to see where they take things in the future Every time, every time they do something new, I look at these amazing knives and go, I don't know how they can continue to get better, but each and every new series is better. You know, they were sidetracked for a while for making production knives for Todd Begg, for making production knives for Leon Ma, and doing a lot of great models. It's where I think a lot of people kind of forgot, hey, Riette designs and makes their own knives, their own uh, proprietary knives. So, when you look at stuff like this, you realize that they never stopped. They never slowed down, and they never, they never rested. You know, it was Todd Begg that when he sat down with David, he spent over a week with David, uh, teaching him things like how to do the proper, uh, the, the proper way to do a hand rub satin. And David immediately went back, and he implemented that into his designs. He taught him how to do the sweeping plunge lines. He immediately uh, put that into effect in many of his designs. I want to see if it's in the K2. No, the K2 is a little bit more of a uh, straightforward plunge line. But what you're seeing is a knife maker that wants to continually progress and get better. And we don't often see that in the price range of that three to $400. If you're going to focus heavily on anything, focus on the quality. Focus on the materials and the workmanship. Don't focus on the fact that you're paying $400 to $950 for a production knife. I can show you one right now. It's a hell of a lot more expensive. It's a production knife. You guys have seen my Rockstead videos. I still have my Rockstead almost five years later. I will never get rid of it. It doesn't matter that it was a production knife. It is so custom in the way that it's made that it blurs those lines. And so is Riette. 
And keep in mind, everything they do nowadays is limited. It's not like there are 5,000 of these out there in the real world. So to call it a production, I, it's, it's hard to say the word production. It's made in a production manner. That's the only way that we can say that. But they're so limited. Um, there is so much handwork and hand finishing that goes into them. And every single knife, as part of its QC, goes through David Dang's hands before it leaves. So you're assured of getting the highest quality that is possible. Are they perfect? Probably not. I'm sure there's a, a knife or two out there that somebody got that wasn't 100% perfect. But you know what? They also take care of their products too. They back up their products and that's all you can really ask for. The track record that Riyadh has is phenomenal. They're uh, pretty much above reproach. There are a lot of brands that have come up since then. We'll look at Bastion as uh, one example, Bastion knives. They're not bad. Oh, uh, not bad. The Stedemon knives, sorry. Stedemon made the Bastion model. Stedemon knives, you know, they're not bad, but they haven't had a great reputation. They're made a little bit more cheaply. Um, they feel a little bit more clunky and not quite as well put together, yet they were pretty much in the same price range, base model for base model, not comparing it to these. And they didn't quite have that execution that React does. And David continually gets better with every, every evolution is a major step for him. And now we're seeing the beautiful finish work that, uh, that they're able to achieve that typically you're not going to see unless you're spending this kind of money or unless you're buying a custom knife. So... If you've ever looked at Riyadh and went, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I can buy this for X amount of money, or for the same amount of money, I could buy a mid-tech, or I could buy one of the very, very, very high-end customs, I'm sorry, very, very high-end productions from a big company. I don't want to buy a Chinese knife for $400 or $900. I don't want to buy a knife that I don't understand. <clears throat> don't just listen to me. Go out there and, and do the research. Go out there as, as much as I don't want to point people to, to forums because uh, the, the wild amount of misinformation that you will find. Go out there and, and listen to users' experiences on the forums and in social media. You'll be hard-pressed to find anybody that owns a React knife from any generation that says that they're unhappy with it. You're getting a damn awesome knife with premium materials made to specifications that we just typically don't see in this price range. So for me, I always look at them as a good value. But my opinion aside, I hope you've had a chance now to see all of these knives close up, get an idea, and make up your own mind. Figure out for yourself if they're worth it. Rewatch this video on mute. Don't even listen to me. Just take a look at the close-ups, look at the action, and decide for yourself if Riyadh is worth you spending the money on. And I honestly think, once you get one in your hands, you're truly going to feel like you made a great decision.